book of Haggai. I'm going to take a look tonight at this, what's called a minor prophet. And yet, as we've shared before, when we've looked at other minor prophets, there is no doubt that this man had a tremendous impact upon the work of God in Israel in the post-exilic period of the history of the people of God. So when we say post-exilic, we're talking particularly of that time frame when God had brought back his people from exile in Babylon. They'd arrived to be occupants uh, or subjects rather in, in Persia. And now they were allowed to return Home. So again, as we do each week, a little bit of background to catch everybody up to, uh, up to speed as to where we are in the story. God had told Israel and Judah that if you do not keep the conditions of the covenant, I will have you expelled from the promised land. The promised land, which took Israel hundreds of years to acquire while they languished in Egypt. They came out and spent a whole generation, about 40 years, wandering through the wilderness, destitute. And although God kept them to supply them food and water and made it that their clothing wouldn't wear out and their shoes would keep on, their life was every bit tent dwellers in the desert with no meaning, no purpose, and no fixed address. And finally, we know in the history of Israel, they were given by God's power and His will the, the ability to conquer Canaan land and to occupy it. God had given the promise to Abraham centuries and centuries earlier, and now the promise was finding its fulfillment. But God gave this covenant to this people, Israel, uh, and, 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 and later on the, the divided kingdom of Israel and Judah to the south. God gave them the promise that if you keep the covenant stipulations, if you do what you claim you're going to do, if you're faithful to me, you do not bow down to idols, you do not swear deceitfully, you do not act in ways that is ill-keeping with the covenant, then you will flourish in the land and live long in it. And we've traced the story now for many weeks, in fact, many months, both Israel and Judah were completely bereft of the righteousness that God was commanding them to have in order to faithfully occupy the land. The northern kingdom, Israel, the bigger kingdom, 10 tribes, swept away first into Assyria. Uh, 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 for the most part, we almost never hear of them again. That's it. They're done. Their day is over. It's final. The southern kingdom, which the capital therein is Jerusalem, was given more grace, more time. And in the southern kingdom, we see that there are, although there's great sin and great unfaithfulness, there are times, there are times when spirituality and, and righteousness would rally and the people would make attempts to try and come back to the covenant of God. But in the end, their faithfulness was seen to be lacking, and they were washed away into the empire of Babylon by a king whose name is Nebuchadnezzar. And what Nebuchadnezzar does is he doesn't just drag people away into exile, he destroys their native land, destroys it. So he sets fire and destruction to Jerusalem, the city, and particularly he destroys the temple that cost an exorbitant amount of money, time, and labor to build. And they were told that they would go into exile for 70 years, that that is the time of their lesson and that the land of Israel and Jerusalem would experience a Sabbath unto the Lord. But once 70 years had elapsed, God would bring them home. And so he does. And so he does. In fact, about 538 and thereabouts, God actually raises up an emperor who calls the people. He's the, the first Persian emperor. And he says to the people of Israel, you may return to your homeland, if you will. And so there's a, there's a return. There's, there's a group of people, about 50,000 Jews. They'd been away 70 years. Most of them were born in exile. They'd never seen their homeland. They'd never seen Jerusalem. They had no memory of the temple. But there was still a margin of people in that 50,000 that had memories of what Jerusalem was, what it could be, what, what God was calling it to be. And that 50,000 returned with the, the governor of the city whose name would be Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel is the rightful heir to the throne. He's a descendant of David and he in fact appears in the genealogy of Jesus Christ, which is going to make sense of some of the prophecies we're about to read in Haggai. They returned to Jerusalem and primarily were they charged with building the house of God, rebuilding the temple. 
Not only had the Persian emperor told them to do so because he had asked all the small uh, ethnicities and cultures within the great Persian empire to go back to their cities, build their temples and their places of worship and pray to their own God for the extent and the happiness and the prosperity of the empire of Persia. And so the Persian empire gave the Jews leave to return to Jerusalem under the edict of the emperor and to build God's house. It almost, almost seems a little bit good, too good to be true. It's, it's kind of like you have all this peril and disaster and, and exile, and now finally the emperor says, here's the decree. Here is the decree. Return to your homelands, not only the Jews, but all of these subjugated peoples. In fact, that edict was written on a barrel cylinder, and it has actually been found. It belongs today in the Museum of Britain. If you're ever up that way, you can go take a look at it. The decree is written to return. Build the house of worship and pray for the prosperity of the empire. All these people return, 50,000 under Zerubbabel, back to Jerusalem. You can imagine what that first day must have been like as they walked up and just saw the state it had been in. Not only because Nebuchadnezzar and his armies destroyed it so thoroughly and burnt it with fire, but now 70 years, 70 years of neglect and they walk up and they see it and their hearts are grieved and yet they are they're enthused they're motivated what god can what god can equip us and empower us to do for him if we come back if we rally if we work together in unity we can really do something spectacular for the lord they get back they start to build foundations they get very 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 early stages in the project and they stop. I mean, you know building projects, right? You know building projects. Building projects can be pretty hard to keep people's motivation up. I've learned recently. And so we see that these people return, and now they return, they're in Jerusalem, and they're there to build the temple, and they get distracted. They start to delay. They start to postpone the work. And not only that, but there are other people, this this kind of half-caste ethnicity of people right there in the vicinity of Jerusalem called the Samaritans. And they start to attack the Jews and they start to cause great havoc for them. And and they start to to challenge them and, and try to stop them rebuilding the city, the walls, and the temple. God sends a man. God's answer to this problem of the fact that he's brought home the first wave of returning exiles, 50,000, or about 48 or something thousand, Jewish people back home, they started with all this zeal, all this enthusiasm, and then it takes a matter of time and they cease the work and God raises up his man, the prophet Haggai. He's the guy. He's the guy that's going to be sent right in there into Jerusalem to begin to speak to the people of God and cause them to be stirred to the task that God had called them to do. If you're on the book of Haggai, why don't we take a look at chapter 1. It's actually a very short book. It only goes for two very short chapters. So I suspect that in our discussions tonight, we might actually cover the majority of what's written here. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, this is verse 1, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. So Haggai is sent by God under the second emperor, Darius the king, the emperor of the Persian Empire. And he arrives and he doesn't address the people. He's not there to preach a sermon to the 50,000 inhabitants of the returning Jews. He's there to speak to the leaders. He's there to grab the scruff of the neck of not only the high priest who's returned, but the governor Zerubbabel itself. And therefore we read verse 2. Thus says the Lord of hosts. These people say the time has not come yet to rebuild the house of the Lord. And the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while the house, this house, lies in ruins? I've noticed as I've been in pastoral ministry now for well and truly over a decade, I've noticed that for the most part, one of the things that people, I would, I would actually say one of the more prominent excuses, should we call it, that people kind of lunge toward and they grab hold of when they find that they haven't been altogether obedient as God has called them to be, is 
It's not God's timing yet. It's not, God, it's not God's timing. Challenge comes, the word of the Lord comes, you're sitting there, you're hearing a sermon, you get all enthused and motivated and you know what you need to do and the first sign of opposition, your response, maybe not you, maybe just me, but the response is, well, clearly it's not God's time. You know, I, I, I went out, I, I, I took the gospel tracks, I, I went to preach the gospel, I went to share with my friends and my family and they rebuffed all my attempts to communicate to them the grace of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's probably not God's time yet. Or, 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 or maybe God has given you charge to, to do something great for him in ministry or serve him in some capacity in the church and you came up against some opposition, whatever it may have been. And it seems to be that these people in this city in Jerusalem in this day are altogether very similar to what we tend to be today. We often want to question, is it God's time? We have this assumption that if God tells us to do something, that in the progress of doing that something, it'll be easy I don't know where this assumption comes from I don't know I don't know how this is so innate to all of our natures if we were to take a look at God's only begotten son on earth here himself we would never conclude the idea that God's will always happens easily and so the people of Israel return they return 50,000 fully enthused fully pumped up, fully zealous and, and ready to build the house of God and they meet a little bit of conflict. They meet a bit of, uh, uh, they meet the resolutions of the Samaritans, the people who stand up against them and they've begun to tell themselves it's clearly just a timing thing. It's not, it's not God's time yet to go ahead and build and Haggai comes and the word of the Lord through the prophet says, is it not time? But it's time for you to live in nice houses. It's time for you to build your own homes and your own families and your own vineyards. And we keep reading the prophecy of Haggai and the material we have in Ezra and Nehemiah. These returning, these returning people had done almost everything else except build God's house. They built vineyards, they built fields for grain and, and they built threshing floors and, and they built storage vats and silos and they built all these things to live luxuriously in the land. But they'd neglected God's house. It's not time yet. Haggai says, is it time to be living in paneled houses? Is it time to be living in great, nice, exorbitant homes yourself when the house of the Lord still remains a rubble? There's a principle here. God is, I'm sure you detected it, God's a little upset. And the principle here with, with which God is upset at is that far too often, and let's not be overly critical of these people this evening when we can turn the microscope so closely in on ourselves, God is not impressed, not impressed when his people show more zeal, show more eagerness, show more desperation to live lives of luxury themselves while his house and his place of worship is left amiss. God is not impressed. Haggai probably doesn't come on the scene with his prophecy for the people of Israel if the reality is not only was the temple in ruins, but they were living in tents. He probably says nothing. But God can see, God can see the zeal that these people had begun to expend on their own homes, their own families, their own livelihood, their own day-to-day -day life. And God says, what about my house? Where are your priorities? The child of God should have as their chief and primary desire the extension of God's kingdom. Maybe it's not as compelling when I say it, but what about when Jesus says it in his own words, seek ye first the Kingdom, seek ye first the, keep first the kingdom and all these things, all this stuff, all these additives, all these necessities will be granted to you. The returning Jews had sought the kingdom, kind of, but it was way down the list. It was third in priority, maybe fifth, maybe ninth, maybe twelfth, a little opposition and the will of God for their life went running and they refused and they claimed it clearly wasn't God's time. Let's keep reading what the prophecy continues to say. <clears throat> Verse 5, Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Now these people, these people don't realize this, but God has for a long time, in fact, let's be real about this, about 18 years, nearly 20 years, this place lighted in ruins. 
Now, I know, I know when we went as a church through a building project, we felt like it was just, it was just lagging on, right? Don't put your hand up. I know. We all felt it. It was just lagging on. This is a 20-year building project, and it didn't need to be. Once they got themselves into gear, it took four years to complete the temple. But they arrived. They started the work. Opposition came, and they threw down their tools and said, let's build our own house. Let's build our own vineyard. Let's build our own field. Let's, let's build our own, our, our, our own places of work and leisure and enjoyment. Let's just take care of ourselves. But this whole time, God had seen this. And this whole time, God had actually been punishing them, and they didn't even realize. This is the incredible thing, that that when God calls the people to obey Him and step out in faith and, and follow the path that He has ordained them to follow, that if they refuse to follow, their life will start to fall into shambles and tatters, and often they don't even know why. I know in my own context, as, as, uh, as a pastor, having to sit down with people, especially people slightly longer in the tooth than myself, been in, been in church most of their life, maybe decades, and begin to speak to them, and, and, and they tell me how their life has just kind of all fallen apart each year, each month, something else goes wrong, and we can, as we begin to talk, and this person begins to divulge their life, we soon find out that there was a, there was a distinguishing point of disobedience. When God had told them to do something, walk in a direction, obey a certain command, fulfill a certain desire, a dream, an ambition, and they failed. 20 years down the track, Haggai appears on the scene. This is what the Lord God says. Consider your ways. Look at this carefully. You've sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. He who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Verse 7 again, there's repetition. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You think some point in that nearly two decades of time, 18 years, they arrived, started building, left their tools, went back to their homes, harvested vineyards, granaries, wineries, everything you can imagine to live life. And God said the whole time, I have been myself, I have been intentionally pulling the rug out from all your attempted prosperity. Even when you eat your fill, you are hungry seconds later. When you clothe yourself in thick clothing, you are freezing cold. When you try and save money for the purpose of getting ahead a little bit financially, you're putting your money in a bag with holes. God takes full responsibility for sabotaging people's lives when they have refused to obey Him. We, we, we often think the will of God is hard, and often it is. The Jews return, they return from from Persia and everything looks like it's going to be great and they arrive in Jerusalem and they start work and the Samaritans come and all kinds of persecution, hostility, revolt occurs and they say, this is too hard and they try to fatten themselves in their own livelihood. But guess what? If God loves you, disobedience will always be harder than obedience. Always. I wonder why no one noticed why did no one say anything? Why did no one say? Why, why did no one mention it? You know, after the second or third or fourth or tenth or fifteenth winter, has anyone noticed we just can't get warm? No one. No one's, There's no. There's no mention of it. They tried to obey God and they failed because the resistance and the hostility and, and, and the attack of the enemy caused them to throw down their tools and refuse to follow God's will for their life. And sometimes, not sometimes, we often do this ourselves. Well, God, if I do that, I think it's going to be really hard. The message of Haggai is, you try and disobey, then you'll learn what hard looks like. And so it is. And so the prophet comes and God speaks and says, you've been poor. Your your harvest has been poor. Your your money's not going anywhere. You've been freezing. You eat, but you can't get full. God is saying to them, thus says the Lord, consider your Ways, go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. Verse 9, you looked for much and behold, it came to little and when you brought it home, I blew it away. That's devastating. Do you imagine hearing Haggai say that? 
Can you imagine every time you brought home in a big bale harvest of wheat or grain or whatever it is, whatever your particular profession was, you brought it in, you were so excited about how much harvest there was this year, and God blows it away every time. How frustrating that must be. God, because he loves you, refused to let your disobedience succeed. I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house. My house that lies in ruins, which each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore, the heavens above you withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought of the land and the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, and what the ground brings forth on man and beast and on all their labors. This is absolutely devastating. The will of God for our lives so often is a challenging route, and it ought to be. No one has ever or should ever have promised that obeying God in your life is going to be a cakewalk. There should never have been anyone sell that to you. Know that obeying God, standing out from the crowd, being marginalized from society, being the strange, weird, incredibly alien person in this world is not going to be easy. God doesn't promise it is. I don't, know who, I don't know who first said it, one of the reformers maybe, I'm not sure which one, but there is this saying which is, which is just, so, it's just so salient to us, and that is that God has had one son on this earth that never sinned, but he's never had a single child on earth that's never suffered. This idea that, I don't know when we're born with it, maybe we're, we become ingrained with it, with the individualism of the Western world, maybe it's something we grow up and we adopt or we assume or we imagine this idea that we are going to walk through life like a bed of roses needs to be crucified to the cross of Christ. And we realize that obedience to God is costly. Obedience to God for many might even cost their life. But disobedience is not an option. And God refuses to allow it to be so. So there they are. They're in Jerusalem and Haggai has Haggai come. And now we read the result. Verse 12, Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. And the words of Haggai, the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. I am with you, declares the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. They came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. And on the 24th day of the month, in the sixth month, in the second year of Darius, the king. It's chapter 1. This moment, it is but a moment, but it is profound. Chapter 2 is going to relate slightly some more historical information, but it's going to be more prophetic now. It's not going to relate necessarily to these people that are returning exiles. It's going to speak more to why the temple is so important to God. God has always been pleased to localize his presence in worship. Even back at the start with Eden itself, it was not just a garden. If when, you, when you picture Eden, if you just think of a, a lavish rainforest, you're failing to get a grasp of what it is. It's a sanctuary garden. It's a place of worship and God's presence in that place as he dwells with his, with his Adam and his Eve, the, the jewel of his creation. Not just some rainforest that kind of grows uh, as it will, and Adam's kind of the, the gardener, but a, but a temple, a, a sanctuary. Yes, still a garden, still growing with great and glorious things that God has made in his creation, but a sanctuary. We know that when God brought his people out of Egypt, part of the Mosaic Covenant, part of the Mosaic Code was to establish a tent of meeting, which went on to be called the Tabernacle. And in this tent of meeting, Moses and the people made an ark of the covenant that resembled the covenant God made with them. And they made with God the stone tablets of the commandments were laid therein. The rod of Aaron which budded and the ark was placed in the holiest place in the temple. And sacrifices would continue month and year after year to God in an attempt to abate his wrath against sin. And we trace the history as we go. We know that then they possessed the land. And David conquered Jerusalem, a stronghold that, as far as we can tell, had almost never been conquered before. 
held by the, the Canaanites called the Jebusites. And David came and with an incredible commanding display of his brilliance, he took the city, built a home for himself, a palace. And then he said to the Lord, I want to build you a permanent house. And God said to David, because you wanted to build my house, I will build yours. I call this the Davidic covenant. The covenant that the Lord made with David, that was every bit of covenant that related to the Messiah who is to come. Jesus is called son of David because of the prophecy that was given to David and the covenant made therein. But David was refused permission to build God a house. David's son Solomon would in fact build the house with all the gold and the silver that was transported from all the neighboring nations and faraway seacoasts and slave labor would be brought in and they would build this incredible temple. And then, as I've already said this evening, Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians would come down and crush the thing to nothing more than rubble and dirt. We need to pick up chapter 2. God is always... God has always prioritized the localization of his presence. It's an important point. In the seventh month of the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak. How many times should I have to say that? All right. Who's getting a little bit like we, we know. We know who he's talking to. Uh, the Bible is replete with detail. Sometimes when you think it might not need to be. But it is because God is good. The high priest and to all the remnant of the people and say this. This is the word of the Lord. Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? That's pretty depressing, hey? So, so Haggai comes, the prophet, the Spirit of God on him, speaking the very words of Jehovah, and the, the remnant is assembled, 50,000 people, and Haggai screams out, how many here were there when you could see the temple the last time it was established in Jerusalem? I don't know how many people. Few. There would have been few. We're talking 70, oh, now we're talking lots more than 70 years. Lots more than 70, but, but clearly there were some. The answer is there were some. Maybe three, I don't know, maybe two. And the word of the Lord says, how much different does it look? The temple of Solomon was perhaps one of the greatest temples that's ever been built. In grandeur, in size, in decoration, in glory. And now they're looking at this thing that God's called them to build. It was entirely dwarfed by Solomon's temple. It looked like nothing compared to Solomon's temple. Who was there back then and was able to see what Solomon built How much different is this now? It's not a great way to start a sermon. I've been preaching once or twice in my life. You don't start out like that. Make everyone really sad. I like what you've done here, guys, but truthfully, it stinks compared to what was here before. It's really, really bad. So bad. Who remembers the last one? You get it. This, what you've done here, I mean, good on you for doing it, really bad. It's not a good way to start. Start a sermon. Let's continue to see why God would have Haggai call this to remembrance. Verse 4, yet now be strong, Zerubbabel declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. According to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your Midst, fear not. The temple may have stank compared to what Solomon had, but that promise is drastically more glorious. Work, I am with you. My spirit abides with you. Do not be afraid. For thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once more in a little while I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land and I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all the nations shall come in and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Silver is mine, gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. This is why the temple really matters. This is why this temple really matters. I had mentioned earlier that God has always seen as a priority the localization of his presence. 
the particular and unique localization of his glory and his person in a, in a particular place. God has always seen that as a priority in the garden, in the tabernacle, in the temple. And now this temple is built. And the promise of the Lord is that you ought to work and labor and strive all the while knowing that what you build, what you build will be nothing compared to what Solomon built. But, but the glory, the glory of this latter house shall be infinitely greater than the glory of the former. Why? What, what's going to what would make it, what's going to make it greater? What's going to make it more spectacular? You remember when Solomon dedicated his temple, the Shekinah glory came down, filled the temple, the priests were unable to minister. It was a tremendous moment of God signing his seal of delight upon the building of the, the first temple. What would make this temple smaller, less grand, less decorated, less gold? What would make this more glorious? Well, we just read it. Let's take a look again. Verse 36, for thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once more in a little while I will shake the heavens. I love the Lord's little whiles. We know when this is going to happen. It's not a little while by my estimation. I will shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all the nations so that the treasures of all the nations shall come in. And I will fill this house, house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. There's a collapsing here. This prophecy is a collapsing of two events, two world-changing, irrepeatable, unrepeatable events. This is what this prophecy is. The glory of Solomon's house was tremendous. We know it was. We, we read about the Shekinah that presents itself there and the priests collapsed and, and couldn't minister. We know it was a, a great glory, but the glory of the latter house shall be granted for the treasure of the nations, the delight of the nations. He who is not only fully God, but is fully man. He who which, that which makes Jesus Christ so treasurous and precious to us is not only that he is the very presence of God, but that he is the presence of God in our form. He is God come near to us. The temple that Zerubbabel will build will be the very temple that Jesus himself is dedicated in. That Jesus marches in toward the back end of his ministry. He chases out of the courtyards and the places, all the money lenders and, and, and the tables of commerce and economy. He cleanses his tent. And the disciples remember, at that moment they remember, it is written, zeal for my house shall consume me. The glory of the Lord came. We know that in that visitation, that first visitation of Christ, the vast majority of people that lived then were entirely unaware of who had arrived. They just didn't know. Now we know because we see with the eye of faith that which the scripture reveals for us that Jesus Christ is God here now in our form, fully God, fully man, at the one time without mixture. Jesus is our Redeemer, our Messiah, our Savior. He filled the house, but He's coming again. And that's why I say when it says in a little while, it's perplexing because it's it's probably not a little while as you and I are judge a little while. Grab your Bibles and turn to Hebrews with me. If you don't have your Bible, it's up here on the screen behind me, the text we're about to take a look at. Hebrews chapter 12. <clears throat> collapsing. There's a collapsing of two prophetic moments. The temple, the temple that you build, Zerubbabel, will be the place where God himself will come in Jesus Christ. No longer glory, no longer presence, no longer anointing, no longer power, but the very person of God, Jesus Christ. But there's another part of that prophecy, isn't there? It's not just that God will come. It's not just that the glory of this temple will outweigh all the glory of the old. There's another promise here that I want to draw your attention to. And the author of Hebrews does a great job here of contrasting these two realities. I started reading at verse 25. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. He's speaking of Christ. I'm reading from the NIV. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken. That is, created things 
so that what cannot be shaken may remain. This is every bit the eschaton. This is the final moment. This is the conclusion of it all. The glory of the Lord came to the temple that Zerubbabel built. His name was Jesus Christ, and he came as the Lord and as the Lamb and gave his life for sinners. He didn't come that day with a lamb in his arms or a a goat or a dove to sacrifice. He came himself to die for his people's sins. He was the lamb. And the prophecy in Haggai, which is picked up for us by the author of Hebrews, there is coming a shaking, a shaking of the earth and the heavens, of the sea, of the fields, of all created things. There's going to be a shaking so that it will be apparent those things that have been created. The shaking of God, the, the, the sifting of God, the, the refining shake of God so that all the things in this world that are not of Him, do not honor Him, are not called of Him, do not bow the knee to Him and confess with the tongue that Jesus is Lord, will be shaken off and discarded and destroyed. There's one more verse in Hebrews we should take a look at, or two more in fact. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, Let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Haggai prophesies this. He prophesies not only the first coming of Christ, he prophesies the second coming of Christ. I love prophets that do that. I feel like that's kind of, I feel like that's kind of like you've hit all the you've hit all the marks. Like, I feel like that's in, in the prophecy you speak at the one time by the Spirit of God of the, the arrival of Christ to this small, seemingly insignificant temple uh, by contrast to Solomon's. And then he speaks of that coming of Christ, which we anticipate. And Haggai says, in a little while. In a little while for Haggai, I don't know, 2,600 years ago? And who knows when yet our hearts ought to delight to think it could be any moment now that Christ will come. When he comes, he will come no longer as the lamb, as the lamb who is ready to be slain for sinners. He will come as the roaring lion, ready to take vengeance on all who have yet to bow the knee to him. All the earth will be shaken. All the heavens will be shaken. All the sea and the beast therein will be shaken. And all that does not cohere to God's will, the righteousness which comes through faith, will be destroyed. The application we're told in the verse is this. Let us be thankful that we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. The only way to survive that final apocalypse is to be in Christ, is to be a citizen of his kingdom, is to be a member of his church, is to be in Christ and let the world shake. My security is firm in him. Let us be thankful. Receiving a kingdom that can't be shaken and let us worship God acceptably, reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. I feel like that's an appropriate spot to end our discussion around Haggai. Let's pray together, shall we? We thank you, Father, for the Scriptures. We thank you, Lord, for the revelation of Jesus Christ all throughout the Bible. Every book of the Bible, particularly every book of the Old Testament, reveals Him, speaks of Him, prophesies Him, foreshadows Him, and gives us our delight. We thank you that He's spoken of as the, the treasures of the nation, that Jesus Christ will have a kingdom that cannot be shaken, he will have a kingdom where the, where the citizens will come from every tribe and nation and tongue. Right across the world, Jesus Christ's kingdom will envelop it all. We thank you, Lord God, that our Savior, He came. He came in our form. He came in our flesh and He died upon the cross so that we, we are sinners, that we can be forgiven. And that He was buried And then he rose again in glory so that all who trust in him, all who place their trust in him, will be offered a salvation that can never fail. We pray tonight as we meditate upon the example of these Jewish people who've come back from exile and they got distracted and delayed and they, they, began to be, they began to be obstructed by persecution and hostility from others. I, I pray as we reflect upon this, Father, we begin to think, what have we left undone? What have we failed to see through? What have we failed to pursue? Who were we praying for that they come to faith and we've neglected to continue? 
Who have we sought to speak to and share the gospel with and we've kind of left them off and, and regarded them as unsavable? Who, who have we neglected? What ministry, Father, have you called us to by your spirit and we failed to step out in faith and see it realized? I pray for us all, Father, tonight. I pray that we would recognize that the Bible says to each is given a gift by the Holy Spirit. We would be zealous to use it to build your kingdom, to seek first, Lord God, the prosperity of your house. And all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.